morning. Uh, the State and Local Government Committee will come to order. We don't yet have quorum, but we're going to get started on our work. Uh, first up today, on April 29th, uh, is Senator Mohammed's 4890. Senator Mohammed. Introduce yourself for the committee and you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, good afternoon, members. Before you, Senate file 4890, a bill to ratify the compensation plans from the Subcommittee on Employee Relations. This bill ratifies the, uh, the Commissioner's Plan, Managerial Plan, Office of Higher Education, Unclassified Personal Compensation Plan, Minister Compensation, Compensation Plan, and the Minnesota State Administrator's Personal Plan. MMB plans are a 5.5% increase in salaries effective July 1st, 2023, and 4.5% on July 1st, 2024. Annual merit base increases generally of 3.5%. On average, about half of the covered employee relations are eligible for these increases. The Minnesota State Colleges and University Personnel Plan for Administrators covers 590 under, underrepresented administrators. The plan includes 2.5% merit increase effective both July 1st, 2023 and July 1st, 2024. Continue merit-based increases from a pool of 2.5% for fiscal year 2024 and 2025. Approximately 85% of employees are eligible for this. Um, MMB and Minnesota State estimate that the total cost of these plans are approximately $84 million. With me is Nick, who will testify, and I appreciate you, and I'll take questions. Um, thank you, Senator Mohammed, and Nick, you may introduce yourself for the committee and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Nick Nigro with the Legislative Coordinating Commission, and our office provides staff support for the Subcommittee on Employee Relations. Uh, Senator Mohammed covered a lot of the high-level changes in these compensation plans. Uh, the only thing I want to add in addition is if in your handout you refer to the last page, there is a settlement sheet um, and uh, just has some numbers for these plans. Um, and for the four MMB plans, uh, these plans will increase costs uh, to those uh, agencies of about 69.7 million in the 24-25 biennium or 7.7% uh, and will result in increased costs of 91 million in the next biennium or 10.1%. Uh, and then for the 590 unrepresented administrators at Minnesota State, uh, the fifth plan, uh, that will result in increased costs of 20.3 million in the next biennium or 9.3%. Um, and in this biennium, it increased costs of about 69.7 million, uh, which is 6.8%. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the plans. And I know our friends from MMB are here in case members have more technical questions as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Nigro. Uh, we are we have quorum, and so I'm going to officially move Senate File 4890 before the committee. Um, that's all I have on my list for testifiers. Senator Mohammed, do you have any other testifiers before I go to member questions? I do not. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Members' questions? Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Mohammed, the... Uh, I appreciate you bringing the, the, the bill forward, and, and I think for our citizens, and, and at least up until we hear a bill later in this committee, um, the legislature is still involved in at least some minimal oversight since the subcommittee employee relations has been neutered in providing any effective oversight of, of state contracts. We know it's important to have a great relationship between the workforce and, and the employee management and, and all those things, but you know, the first group you just laid out was, it's essentially um, with 5.5%, 4.5% second year, Step increases average about 3.75 percent, or just about around there. 17 and a half percent increase in in the next two biennium contract. Um, the citizens that support um, all the taxes that pay and earn those taxes um, aren't anywhere near that in the economy. And the growth and cost of government is continuing to grow. It's vital that we have a blend and, and a mix and a match that that is competitive and and all those things, but. We continually um, want the pay 
and yet we haven't baked in any accountability in government, so citizens feel extraordinarily great about the government they get. And so um, always looking for opportunities to work with members across the aisle about how do we transform government so we can be excited about paying extraordinarily competitive wages, but also build in the accountability, for which I would love to work with somebody on. Um, at the end of the day, then, we would have, we truly would, we wouldn't have to worry about these issues. We would be able to prove great value to our citizens. But these packages are going to be very difficult for the average hardworking family to support this level of government. And we're seeing it across the board. So um, that's 17.5%. That's not including all the costs and the benefit packages that we have just for this biennium, for that first group that you mentioned. I know not all of them are at that level. But the average citizen would have no idea and have no opportunity to have a 17% increase in their compensation or their wages. Um, and yes, that's for the 50%, that's on the high side, the 50% of the people who are eligible for step increases. Um, but that's a huge number. So even when you take that out, 9.5% um, or 9% increase over in a, in a biennium is, is a lot for the average person. So um, thank you for bringing it forward. I hope we have the opportunity to provide the transparency and would love to work with somebody to uh, transform the workforce so we can be excited and have even better compensation packages. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Cran. I'm excited to hear you were potentially supportive of a full-time legislature to provide oversight. Um, members, any other questions? Okay. Senator Mohammed, closing remarks. Thank you for hearing this, and I think that there's more work to be done, and I appreciate you, Senator Coran, for your remarks. Happy to work with you on what you're working on, and appreciate the committee for your time. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Um, so I will move that Senate File 4890 is recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The motion prevails, and Senate File 4890 is, recommend, is passed and placed on general orders. Thank you. Um, next, we will have Senate File 4355, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I, um, I, I do want to thank you uh, the, to, to point out this is Senate File 4355, and this is a simple bill that addresses the Hennepin Health System's issues with worker retention and patient care in relation to their budget, not anything else, it's relation to their budget. This bill simply changes the language from, ready, shall approve to approval with a majority vote. Uh, what this will do is help to change the statute to, to reflect the intent of the language rather than how it's working in practice. And so I have Chair Fernando here with me today to help explain the significance of this change, as well as um, Jeremy and Mariah, who are nurses, that they'll come in as well. So Madam Chair, a new Madam Chair. So there Thank you go. You. That's the bill, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair, if yes. you could please proceed. Yes. Chair and members, my name is Irene Fernando. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm Chair of the Hennepin County Board. I want to thank the bill author, Senator Hoffman, and the Minnesota Nurses Association for bringing this legislation forward. In December of last year, my colleagues and I took an action to ensure Hennepin Healthcare System, also known as HCMC, and their 2024 budget meets the accountability and transparency we expect from public institutions. As chair of the Hennepin County Board, I'm proud that we own the only local government-owned level one safety net health system in the state of Minnesota. Hennepin Healthcare is a critical resource, not only for Hennepin County, but for the entire state. That's why it's imperative that we listen to people, the workers who are at the front line of keeping our community healthy. This change in statute will give the board clarity and better oversight in our role managing our hospital and reflects your legislative intent. The structure of our ownership and the expectations around oversight are spelled out in chapter, in statute, chapter 383B, starting in section 901. We are exercising the tools the legislature provided us. We welcome any and all additional tools to exercise oversight that you might grant me and my colleagues on the Hennepin County Board. I appreciate the trust you have in our ability to ensure that every public dollar the residents of Minnesota send our way are well spent to improve health outcomes. We know that the bedrock to this is investing in our staff, every person who delivers care to our patients, from maintenance staff up to our nursing staff and to each and every caregiver. Together, we won't let our staff down. The Hennepin County Board understands this assignment, and we know that health outcomes for all of Minnesota depend on a well-run HCMC and the broader health infrastructure that the county owns and operates. 
Thanks for your time and consideration and support of this bill. Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Hoffman. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. The, uh, there's also a letter I forgot to say at the beginning. There's a letter of support. There's a handout in your packets, Hennepin County Association of Paramedics and EMTs. So with that, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Olson Elhart. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Jeremy Olson Elhart. I'm a registered nurse and MA Tri Chair at Hennepin Healthcare, um, where I've been employed the last 11 years. Um, in the world of healthcare, where every moment matters and lives are on the line, there's a bond between those who heal and those who seek healing. It's a promise we make to each other to be honest, to be there when needed, no matter what. Transparency isn't a choice, it's a must. Being responsive isn't an option, it's a duty. We're not just talking about ideals here, we're talking about real lives, real struggles, and real dedication. When things get tough, when the pressure's on, we're here standing strong for a healthcare system that's there for everyone, no matter what. However, workers at Hennepin Health System learn the hard way when there's no transparency in our budget process and our and current Minnesota state statute mandates that county commissioners approve the budget. Let me describe what the recent budget changes meant for HCMC staff. Imagine a mother, a nurse, whose world revolves around the fragile life of her daughter with a rare genetic disorder. Last year, our health plan provided a lifeline, a safety net of support that eased her burden, but now that safety net is unraveling replaced by barriers of bureaucracy and increased costs. Her daughter's medication was once easily accessible, is now mired in delays and financial strain. Or consider another nurse who has relied on a specialized medication for over two decades. What was once a uh, manageable expense has now become a financial burden, a toll exacted by a system that fails to recognize the value of human life over profit margins. And then there's the reality of delayed care. A nurse's husband suffering from a new cancer diagnosis, having to switch care, organi care organizations and being told they couldn't see him for over six months. In a system where every moment counts, this delay can mean the difference between comfort and agony or life and death. These stories are not isolated incidents. They are echoes of a system in crisis. Yet when we raise our voices, when we seek accountability, we're met with hostility and indifference from those entrusted with leadership. We feel there was no meaningful investment in retaining workers, no meaningful plan to reduce agency nurses, all while the, hospital's board, the hospital board's first action was to raise the CEO salary again. We have 119 open nursing positions right now and continue to see more nurses leave every month. During the HHS budget conversations at the end of last year, nurses heard from commissioners that they had deep concerns about the budget and the lack of meaningful investment in workers. This after there was a large investment in federal pass-through dollars that we helped lobby for at the state legislature with no conversation with direct care staff on what they needed in order to provide um, quality patient care. Yet the commissioners were informed that they were legally required to pass the budget. This is not how Hennepin Health System is supposed to work. But due to the way the language is written in Minnesota state statute, there's very little ability for Hennepin County commissioners to have meaningful oversight into the budget. We are asking you to make a simple change and please support Senate File 4355 and help take a step towards better fiscal accountability and transparency at our safety net hospital. Thank you for your testimony. And <clears throat> Ms. Tunkara. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Mariah Tunkara and I'm a registered nurse at Hennepin Healthcare. I've been there for the last nine years. As nurses at Hennepin Healthcare, represented by the Minnesota Nurses Association, we are fierce advocates for our patient safety and our community's well-being and the welfare of our dedicated team. Our voices ring loud and clear, echoing the heartbeat of a relentless healthcare force. Every day, we pour our hearts into delivering exceptional care to those who depend on us. Over the years, Hennepin Healthcare has evolved and faced numerous challenges, but the commitment from the commissioners of Hennepin County has never been more crucial. The heart of our distress stems from the recent uh, Minnesota Department of Health report, which disclosed that in 2022, our institution contributed to 10% of all reportable adverse events in the state. These events are not just numbers to be set aside. They are tangible, real-world wor occurrences that impact our patients' lives, our community's trust, and the very essence of our healthcare institution. It is an alarming fact that in a single year, the number of such incidences has doubled with a staggering 60 adverse events reported in 2022. These occurrences are directly related to staffing shortages, which not only jeopardize patient safety, but also affect our ability to sustain financially. Nurses, the backbone of Hennepin Healthcare, continue to bear the brunt of chronic understaffing, which contradicts expert findings, stating that it's not a shortage of nurses, but a shortage of a safe, supportive working environment. 
The fact that we, the nurses, felt compelled to pick it in 2022 for the first time ever underscores the gravity of the situation. Under the leadership of Jennifer DiCabellis, our employee benefits were slashed, our premiums were hiked, and our deductibles were inflated, leaving our workforce with a heavier burden to bear. This, as the CEO awarded herself a massive raise while claiming a budget crisis, is not just preposterous, but a slap in the face of every nurse, caregiver, and employee who gives their all to this institution. Due to all of this, we see needed change at Hennepin Healthcare and ensuring that Hennepin County Commissioners have the ability to approve or not approve their budget is a step in the right direction. Please support Senate File 4355 to help workers and patients at our valued safety net hospital. Thank you for your testimony. Members, are there any questions? Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's, uh, Senator Hoffman. So this is, you've only got three word change here, but I you know, wanna, the impact can be big with just a couple of words, right? <clears throat> so I wanna make sure I'm, I'm following through on this, just tracking where we're going. Yep. Because the way it's set up now, Hennepin Healthcare just basically says this is the way we want to structure our budget when, without any impact to the employees. Kind of like a uh, private sector, you know, the guy owns the company and this is how what I'm paying and if you don't like it, you can leave. If you don't like it, you can, if you do like it, you can stay. And the county board has absolutely no oversight of how taxpayer money as opposed to private sector money is being spent. Am I, am I following that correct? Senator Hoffman. Madam Chair and, and Senator Barr, yes. I mean, if you look at what, what uh, Chair Fernando is saying, it's exactly, exactly right. That, that level of oversight, transparency, but you're, that's the best way of explaining it. Our friend, good friend from Anoka County. Let the chair even go deeper into that if you want. Senator Barr, you're good? Yeah, the, I just want to say thank you. I'm just, I'm, thanks for bringing some more tra transparency, Bill. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I... Uh, Commissioner? Yes, if, if, if I may, um, the, the governance model, the existing governance structure, uh, do, there is a relationship with respect to the budget um, process, but it is, it is not codified in statute or in the bylaws between the county board and the HHS board. Um, and, and really what this does is it clarifies that the county board must approve a budget by a majority vote of commissioners. And so that in order to do that, in order for this to be true, of course, um, additional opportunities for uh, interaction would, would, need, would need to occur for a majority vote to prevail each year. Thank you for the additional clarification. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Hoffman. Um, I just want to understand what, our, what the goals are here. Who, who's, and maybe if you, if you all could just walk us through kind of what, how it works now. Like who sits on the Hennepin Healthcare Board now? Are there county commissioners on the board? Commissioner? Madam Chair, Senator, yes, there are two commissioners uh, on the board. I'm one of them. And then Commissioner Marion Green. And I've uh, had the privilege of serving on the HHS board since 2020. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and who else is on the board currently? Commissioner? Thank you. It's uh, made up of, to, it's about 14 or so people, um, multiple physicians, and then a number of um, various members that are from the community, although I, I want to be clear because healthcare does have a perspective on community boards, particularly with FQHCs. So the subsidiary corporation has a board and its own uh, governance structure that receives applications for upcoming members, and so it, it also has uh, current or not current, former healthcare execs and, and others who have had experience with care delivery. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. So there, you all must see an annual budget or something. The board must see an annual budget. I'm just, in terms of transparency, there's already, there must be some already. Commissioner? Ch Chair, uh, Senator Morrison, um, last year, the county board uh, did, was not able to review a budget until November. And so to, uh, I apologize. And uh, do, uh, with, with state statute as it is, we must close our legislative session by December 12 of 2023. And so in effect, the county board uh, did not have any sort of material check-in for that particular budget. Uh, I'm, I'm not characterizing all of the years, but if, if part of the question, um, Senator, Dr. Morrison, I don't know which one goes first, 
about why, why this was generated, uh, it is because we did not have ample time to review the budget. And then in that process, there was a lot of questions. Is the county board required to pass a budget? And that was truly a discourse. And so this clarifies that yes, we must pass a budget and it, it should yield a majority vote. Thank Senator you. Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for indulging me. Um, so if the, what would happen if the budget wasn't passed? Like if you did, because currently you need 60%, is that why the change now to just a simple majority? And what would, what would happen to HCMC? I'm just, I'm so HCMC, the work that you all do at HCMC is incredibly important, as you all know. And I just, I wanna make sure we're being really thoughtful if we're gonna make a dramatic change that, that threatens that institution. That's my fear. I hear you. Commissioner. Madam, Madam Chair, so first and foremost, this should not threaten any of, of the care that we receive. Hennepin County is very proud to have an extensive healthcare service delivery and infrastructure. From mental health to behavioral health to healthcare for the homeless, all uh, including uh, HCMC. HCMC, one of several facilities and several services, um, from reproductive health care to those who are in need of addiction supports. I mean, truly, we span that because it is our absolute commitment, and I'm proud of uh, the county board's unwavering commitment over many, many cycles and many, many commissioners to ensure that every single Hennepin resident and quite frankly, Minnesotan is able to receive the care that they need. So, so first and foremost on the mission portion, that is absolutely the direction that the Hennepin County Board has codified over many years and it is 100% my individual commitment that I can assure here. Uh, this is not a large change. Um, a majority vote is only four votes for us. I know that's, Math is a little bit uh, more straightforward um, uh, with my assembly. And so this is the same. It, it already is a shall. Uh, what was difficult is last year, many people were asking the very question that you asked. What would happen if? And this is saying we must pass a budget because the organization, HHS, must remain continuously operating. And, and of course, Musts are difficult unless it's accompanied with an annual budget. And so I, my commitment is far, far beyond 2025's budget, you know, right, going into next year. Um, but the, the change here really clarifies to the county board who has the existing oversight for the entity anyway that we must act. Okay. If that's helpful, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair, or Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman. Um, so I'm still, I, I think we've had a good conversation, but just kind of curious what, what brought it forward. You described it, it described kind of the scenario of what could have, it hasn't happened, but what could have happened. But I'm interested in, Commissioner, you represent kind of the board and also sit on the Hennepin County Board as well. Who brought this forward? The Hennepin County Medical Center or the actual Hennepin County Board Who's the driver of this? The board as a, as a whole? Was there a majority vote by the board, board seeking this legislative approval? Or is it an individual member or just a couple members bringing this forward from the head of the county board, not, the, not HCMC? Um, Madam Chair, uh, Senator, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. This, is, this reflects the legislative intent. We believe that the legislative intent was that the county board shall approve the annual budget but because of the immense discourse really in November and December of last year, there was a lot of discussion around, well, what would happen if it wasn't passed? Right. Ma and Madam so Chair. This, this clarifies that we must. Madam Chair and, and Commissioner, that Senator I understand Pratt. what you described of what could have happened. What I'm looking for is who's driving it, because I see you represent, you have a dual role representing both the county and Hennepin County Medical Center. I also see the other testifiers, are the other testifiers on the board of H HCMC? No. Senator Hoffman. Uh, Madam Chair, no, Senator Cran, they're, they're, um, the M&A members are the nurses that are actually at HCMC. And when this discussion came up last year, um, these folks came to me uh, along with a couple of other board members saying, yeah, there's this little, here I am, Senator Jasinski, there's this little, little provision within the, the statute that needs to be looked at. And I said, well, Let's, let's make a technical fix and change it. So that's, that's why this bill's- Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman, which board? Senator so Hoffman. It was a 
commissioners, board of commissioners, in, in a conversation with them just about what the what the issue was. So, and then so I thought, let's bring this bill. So, what you have in front of you is the bill from our M and A folks and and uh, myself. Mad Madam Chair, Senator Cram. That's that's my concern, Senator Hoffman. So M and A is important, but they don't run the hospital. They don't make the decisions for the medical center itself. That's and correct. so, so that's who I see represented. In and you just described well, a couple of commissioners. So the, the Hennepin County commissioners didn't take action because they believed they they needed additional capabilities. Because this means they could also vote it down. Correct. No, Madison. Senator Hoffman. No, I, I actually disagree with you on that one, Senator Cran. What you have is a, a simple technical. We're looking at operation side of it. There's simple technical changes. It's like, let's bring this bill. So what? I'm proud of the fact that our nurses, our m &A nurses that do that, that represent the, the side of it. I think the real compelling argument there is, is there something that needs to be changed? The answer is yes, regardless of, of who or what brought that. I mean, I don't know what your compelling argument is other than that. So I, I disagree with that point, but I, I do bring you this. So do you believe that the current structure, how it sits that when the board gets a notification of the budget that that it, it's working for them right now? Madam Chair. Senator, Senator Graham. Senator Hoffman, it, again, the we talked about a hypothetical what could happen. We, we don't right, to talk about what could happen. Um, it it doesn't, doesn't appear it was broken. And then it appears that, that there are sides coming together um, under the guise of some transparency or, or to make sure that something didn't happen, that, which hasn't happened yet in the ability for the county the Hennepin County Board of Commissioners to do what's right for the citizens of Minnesota and, and the board. I don't see anybody here representing the board um, and the commissioner you serve, and I don't mean disrespect there, but you serve dual roles, but anybody else here testifying from the board of HCMC about that same concern. So it doesn't appear that it's a broad, um, broad consensus on who brought either from the Hennepin County Board or the Hennepin County Medical Center Board on why this is forward. It appears to be a small niche Seeking, seeking the state of Minnesota legislative authority to change the process that doesn't appear to have broken yet. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Actually, I'm on, I don't know, 500 and some bills uh, when you look at it. And as the chair of human services, this has a germane interest to me and as we're talking about that stuff. And so this is specifically in the clause of changing Changing it, it's not a what if. The fact is that there's just a technical change that needs to be done, and this is what we see as, as adding to that transparency side, too. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, I don't know what the, what the disposition of this is. I think. This would be laid over for possible inclusion. Oh, all right. So, awesome. Thank you. Lots of time to talk. Thank you, Madam Chair. In fact, seeing no further questions, uh, Senate file 4355 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair, you. members. We will uh, go to item six on the agenda, which is Senate file 5354 with Senator Dzietzik. Uh When you are ready, please proceed. Well, good afternoon, Chair Mitchell and members of the committee. Uh, a little over a week ago, the Minnesota Racing Commission approved a um, request for running aces in Canterbury for 500 historical horse racing machines. The Racing Commission acted around their statutory authority, which is why I'm bringing this bill forward. The Alcohol and Gaming Enforcement Division at DPS sent a letter to the Racing Commission before the hearing outlining that these machines are not paramutual wagering. Uh, that letter is, I believe, included in your packets. This bill does three main things, prohibits wagering on historical horse racing, prohibits racetracks from offering any form of gambling except horse racing and card room, uh, authorized card room operations that are authorized in Chapter 240, and prohibits the Racing Commission from expanding gambling operations via rulemaking or other authority to include any forms of gambling other than horse racing and authorized card games. The Commission acted improperly when they approved these machines. They are not the legislature, and they do not have the authority to expand gambling in Minnesota. I understand the racetrack's desire to have these machines, but the Racing Commission cannot provide this approval. Um, I have the A2 amendment, which gets the bill in the order I would like it to be, and I believe Senator Gustafson also has an amendment after that. 
Thank you. And this is the first stop, and um, Senator Dietzik offers the A2 amendment to help get the, get the bill in order. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Oppo opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Um, the, the amendment is adopted. Senator Gustafson is offering the A4 amendment. Senator Gustafson, would you care to describe your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Your the amendment. A4 amendment eliminates the provisions of 5354 as amended that deal with stadium gaming. The Racing Commission approved these games in 2018. They are currently in operation at Running Aces. I've heard from constituents about the stadium. Running Aces is very close to my district. Uh, I've, so I've heard from many leaders the stadium gaming provisions in this bill. I'm concerned about eliminating the games. They're already in play. I'm offering the amendment to keep this bill focused only on the historic horse racing machines. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Um, before we get to your um, motion to move the amendment, does everyone have the A2? No. We're going to get the A2 out. It is being printed. Uh, Senator Gustafson's amendment is a one word change. No. Hers is that. No, because. Okay. We will stand by. In the meantime, we have a number of testifiers. Uh, if I'm hearing the amendment makes a difference in the testifiers. Madam Chair. Senator May Quaid. Um, thank you. I j I'm just coming in from a, a different hearing, so I just want to get caught up. So we adopted the A2 amendment, and now we're discussing amending the A2 amendment with the A4. Yes, so we need the A2 because it speaks to the, the A4 speaks to the A2. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator May Quay, can you am amend an amendment that's already been adopted? Yes, you can. Great. Good to know. Thank you. I make laws. Senator Dietzik and members of the committee, um, while we are waiting on a printing issue, we are going to temporarily table this um, until we all have that amendment. And we are going to go to Senate file uh, 5068. Senator May Quaid, if you could come forward and take the gavel, if that is OK, because that is my bill. I'm hoping this one can be possibly quick, as it's uh, just a simple date change.
All right, we're gonna go to Senate file 5068. Senator Mitchell, when you are ready, feel free to start. Thank you so much, uh, Chair and members of the committee. This is Senate file 5068 in your packet, and uh, it is an agency bill that upstates the due date for the uncollectible debt report. I'm joined by MMB Government Relations Director Eric Anderson. Um, it is literally just a date change, and he can explain why that is needed. Um, thank you so much, uh, Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell moves Senate File 5068 before the committee, and um, Mr. Anderson, feel free to begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. I'm Eric Anderson, Director of Government Relations at Minnesota Management and Budget. Again, this is a simple agency bill that proposes to move the due date for the uncollectible debt report from October 31st to November 30. Uh, we've had this report was initially enacted in 2018. We've had the opportunity to complete it five times and have recognized from that process that, that we'd benefit from a little more time to, to review the information before the report is published. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Members, questions? Okay, and with that, uh, Senate file 5068 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Yes. Uh, do, Senator Mitchell, do you want to do your next bill? Is it Senate file 5115? I would love to, Madam Chair. Sounds good. Senator Mitchell, whenever you're ready. Uh, Senate file 5115 is also an MMB agency that adds two agencies to the list of positions covered by the Compensation Council. Um, if I see her coming down. Um, Ms. Leyland is the Enterprise Director for the Employee Classification Compensation, uh, and she can describe the need for this bill. Uh, you may begin. Introduce yourself for the committee and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Dory Leland, Enterprise Director for Employee Classification and Compensation at MMB. Um, the bill before you, Senate File 5115, is fairly straightforward. We see it as kind of a technical catch-up bill. Uh, the um, portion of the bill being amended it lists all of the agency heads, and there were a couple of new entity agencies that were created in the last legislative session. I inadvertently kind of got missed on this list of agency heads, and so the intent is just to be sure that the, um, those agency heads are treated in the same manner. Thank you so much. Uh, members, questions? Okay. Um, Senator Mitchell, would you like to say anything else? Um, I believe we are requesting this. This is laid over for possible inclusion. And uh, again, pretty straightforward. And I would appreciate that consideration. Sounds good. Well, Senate file 5115 is laid over for possible inclusion. Members, I do want to just uh, note that we'll have to recess at 1230 because floor is reconvening. Uh, but we will continue our work until then. And that work will start with do you have another bill, Senator Mitchell? Would you like to I, go with your bill? I do have another bill. It is slightly more complicated, but I am more than willing to tackle it. Well, Senator Mitchell, let's go complicated. Senate file 4761 is moved before the committee. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. Um, this is Senate file 4761. Uh, um, this is not an agency bill. This is um, my own work. And basically, um, as many of you know, I am a foster parent and I've done a lot of work in uh, child protection, abuse, neglected children, and I am now serving on our legislative task force for child protection as one of the co-chairs. Um, when we were looking at many of the issues to make sure that uh, children in Minnesota um, have the best outcomes, for lack of a better term, uh, one of the things that we have identified is that there are some bigger issues within the state that require more comprehensive looks than a legislative task force can sometimes provide. And also, um, even though our legislators on the task force have some really wonderfully diverse backgrounds, it is not all the voices at the table that sometimes need to be at the table to tackle some of these things. And some of the things that we would eventually be looking at would be like, um, mortality reviews to make sure that if there is ever a loss um, that we fully review what happened and how we can improve it. Uh, the fact that Minnesota is a um, one of the few states that runs child protection on a county basis versus a state basis. Is there something better we can do in that interface? Um, 
uh, another big issue, and then I will I will quit giving a list because I could go on forever. But is even the fact that. Um, uh, we have a two-prong system, so some children will go into assessment if there's a report made, and some go into an investigation, and is that being properly handled? So there's a number of things that we think we could bring um, important stakeholders to the table to meet and, and really work at um, possibly reforming some of these parts of the system. Uh, so that is the work that we have done. This has already gone through HHS. And I will say that this would, after this, go to rules because um, uh, we would, on that task force or on that um, council, have legislative nominations to go on there, and that's why that would end up there. Um, with all of that said, we are still doing a lot of work on this. Um, people who have come to the table and said, you know, we'd really like to be part of this group. Um, also, what agency this is going to fall under just to w even where it would meet. So as those conversations continue, I would like to offer the A4 amendment to reflect some of that work we are doing, but also just to be transparent as this moves forward, we are continuing to do the work on this um, to make sure we really get it right when we put it together and working with the House on that. So I would like to move the A4 amendment, please. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell moves the A4 amendment. Um, Members' questions about the A4? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Mitchell, do you have any more remarks about your bill as amended, or would you like to go to member questions, or do you have testifiers? I'm not sure if I have testifiers. Are, are there, there testifiers on the list? Let's are there any uh, members of the public, either online or in person, that would like to testify about Senate file? 4761. Okay. Um, members' questions about the bills amended? If not, then I would like to move that um, it pass and be referred to rules. That is the motion before us, members. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Senate file 4761 as amended is passed and referred to the Rules Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Senator Mitchell. Um, members, we're going to recess quickly. It's a paper-moving, brief, 10-minute uh, session that's reconvening that none of us have to go to. We can stay here. Um, so we're going to recess to the call of the chair. Uh, it is 12.55. The state and local government and veterans committee will resume. We'll come back to order. And first on the agenda will be Senator Murphy with Senate file 4678. Senator, uh, if you could please proceed forward and proceed at your convenience. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. It's good to be with you today. It's good to have you back. It is good to see all your faces on this day. And it's good to be before you with um, this important piece of legislation, Senate File 4678. Um, Madam Chair and members, uh, this piece of legislation before you um, comes as a result of an issue that we've encountered in a multifamily housing uh, unit uh, in the district I represent. Uh, it is a fairly uh, uh, old, if you will, um, well-established uh, facility uh, with uh, an, est an established set of rules that have made the upgrades necessary in the facility um, challenging. And uh, we have worked in ways that you could imagine to try and figure out a solution to this problem without having to come to the legislature. And over many, many months of work on the part of the people who live in the district and live in this facility, we haven't found a necessary solution. Um, we have worked, uh, this legislature in particular has worked very hard on the issue of housing. Uh, and in this session in particular, I think uh, legislators have been working on novel ideas to try and resolve 
um, issues related to housing that are not just about funding, but instead are about the, the ways in which housing is developed, and in this case, the way that housing is protected. Um, we often talk about naturally occurring affordable housing. The example before us is an example of naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, a majority, near majority of people who live in this, um, in this condominium uh, facility uh, are uh, of low income. Uh, and it is important for us to think through how we protect their ability to stay in the place that they call home. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn to our testifiers um, who will bring, I think, to light uh, the situation that they have been dealing with and why this legislation is so important. Thank you, uh, Senator Murphy. First to testify, I have Jean Lee. If you could please, or, I'm sorry. Howard, Howard Ornstein is oh. going to speak first. If you could please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Howard Ornstein. I live next to the low-income senior high-rise in question. I'm a former state representative from the area next to the high-rise, and I volunteered to help when I heard about the funding problem that uh, we're here to talk about. I'm grateful to Senator Murphy that she stepped up to help her low-income constituents solve this problem. The building is, uh, is 1970s construction, so it's almost 50 years old. Um, it's condominiums, which is very unusual for a low-income population. Um, but it's also senior housing meeting the federal HOPA standards. So 25% of the units in the building are required by the bylaws to, be, to meet HUD low-income standards. But we did a survey um, of the residents in order to determine the income of the rest of the building. And we found that 94% of the people responding to the survey um, are meet the HUD low income guidelines, 94%. And most of those are in the lower tiers of the HUD guidelines, so deeply affordable. 62% um, of the residents report Social Security as their primary source of income, and 39% are disabled. So that's the population. Um, the windows in the building have to be replaced now after almost 50 years, and the cost of the project is $6.5 million, which is significantly higher than the low-income senior residents can bear. Our past efforts to secure funding um, from either the federal government, state government, or the city have uh, not been successful because, because it's a condo situation. We just we don't fit into anybody's criteria. So. Um, Senator Murphy introduced the legislation to try to get some funding, which is not the issue before the, why this bill was referred to this committee. But um, there's a section of the bill, Section 1, that um, expands the powers of housing redevelopment authorities. Uh, when we went to the city of St. Paul and their HRA for help, we were told that because of the, the condo structure and who owns the windows and who pays the assessments, we just didn't fit into any other criteria. So what we're trying to do with section one of the bill is expand the powers of local HRAs to assist with financing. It's discretionary, the bill doesn't require that the city HRA help, but it, it does expand their powers to uh, fill that statutory gap. So section one of the bill sets forth the public purposes that qualify a project for assistance. The legislation articulates several factors laying out the policy goals. Uh, the, it's assistance to preserve naturally occurring affordable housing. It has to be a large capital repair project. It has to be in a multifamily building. It has to be for a long-term asset. And the building has to have at least 25% of the units sold to people meeting HUD low-income guidelines. So the public purpose is legisl legislatively established by the criteria in the bill and the legislation will not anticipate or requiring, require any ongoing additional compliance. The language does not limit the assistance to specific low-income units, but applies to the entire project. So that's an explanation of section one of the bill, and uh, we, we are thankful for your consideration. And um, my neighbor, Janet Warwick, is the president of the HOA, and she can give some more information about the people who live in the building. If you could please state your name for the record and then proceed. Madam Chair and members of uh, the committee, my name is Janet Warwick. I've lived in the Wilder Park Senior High Rise since 2016, and the owners there have elected and entrusted me to be the president of the Homeowners Association. I thank you very much, Senator Murphy, for stepping up to help us 
when we really have exhausted all of, the, uh, all of our efforts to try to find assistance from existing housing programs for our expensive project to maintain our property. Our building is old and we need to complete a major life cycle repair of the windows. After value engineering to trim the costs wherever that might have been possible, the cost of the project was reduced to $6.5 million. We cannot delay this project as our engineers have told us that costs are increasing at a rate of, uh, of approximately 10% a year. So if we don't do it now, we're looking at an even bigger cost impact for our owners in the years ahead. The cost of the project is simply way beyond the means of our low-income residents. As Howard mentioned, our demographic survey indicated that 94% of our residents who responded to the survey we did meet the HUD low-income guidelines, most of them in the lower two tiers. Because our residents are older and many are disabled, I am here representing them, and I wanted to relay several stories um, from our owners. Um, Lisa is a widowed Russian immigrant woman, 86 years old and very hard of hearing. She worked while in the United States as a preschool instructor. She purchased her unit six years ago outright when her husband was hospitalized. She wanted to provide him with a, with a um, ground floor unit and plenty of room for a wheelchair. However, he was never able to join her. She paid as much of his costs as she could for five and a half years before his death. The county stepped in to pay the costs when she could no longer pay them herself. But when she dies, the funds owed will be taken from her estate. Now she lives on $1,385 a month from Social Security and pays about $800 in monthly dues before the, without taking into consideration the coming uh, assessment for the, sp the Windows project. She has little left to pay for her assessment and she doesn't know what to do. She said, I worked all my life and I do everything right. Now I stay up many nights and worry about how to pay. I don't want to leave here and where would I go? Lisa's assessments for the windows, assuming a $66.5 million cost, would be $33,475. Helen is a widowed woman, 93 years of age. She and her husband moved into the tower unit, their tower um, condo, three years ago. His health declined, and Helen nursed him as long as she could until he died. Now she's uncertain what to do. Um, she, can, she can't afford to pay the assessment of over $40,000 or at age 93 take out a loan with payments of over $200 a month over 25 years. Another resident, Heidi, is a female owner in her 80s. She has a high mortgage and then took out a second mortgage. She has only about 5% equity in her unit and little in savings. Her special assessment will be $20,000. She says, God will look out for me. Another resident, Janet, is 78. Her fixed costs per month, including food, run about $1,200. She receives a small payment from SNAP for food and currently has re recently has received six month, months of charity care assistance with her medical bills. Her estimated windows assessment is $10,650. These stories could be repeated by many owners throughout our building as one would go from door to door, floor to floor. This affordable housing development is their home, my home. Owners don't want to move at their ages and most have nowhere to go that they would be able to afford. Our residents are looking to you for help. Thank you very much for giving us consideration. Thank, Thank you. you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Lee, if you could come forward and When you're ready, please state your name for the record and proceed. 
Yes, Madam Chair, members, Senator Murphy, thank you. I'm Jean Lee. I head Children's Hope International, uh, which is legal advocacy and public policy. Our and our family centers are our transitional our houses, uh, permanent houses and shelters. We also do housing services, health care, and human services. Um, I also have a background in real estate development, property management, construction, building contracting, and others in the housing industry, and I'm giving you a little background for a reason. Um, I really built a three-story, my three-story house when uh, a tornado hit it, so I know how to use the tools uh, to build, rebuild a house if it happened again. I'm a former uh, Fortune 500 corporate auditor, and I switched from, uh, switched to fixing government systems to better serve Minnesotans. Um, the most affordable homes are those owned for a long time by seniors, including those with no mortgages. Uh, we support uh, homeowners who are seniors and persons with disabilities um, as far as use of the NOAA funds, but also we encourage you to prioritize them and expedite the funds to them uh, since for them to become homeless because they don't have access to funds that can assist them it's kind of like a death sentence because when seniors and persons with disabilities uh, become homeless and in the streets, that's an early death for them and it can be avoided. Um, so we support pr using the funds to preserve their houses so they can age in place and in saving their lives. Um, there are solutions also in some other Senate file 2728 delete all and Senate file 4246. Um, so we support Senator Murphy's bill because it targets um, seniors and persons with disabilities. And also, I'd like to bring your attention to the fact that uh, on your handout, um, Senator Klobuchar said that there should be no waiting line for benefits when it comes to veterans. So veterans were also in our targeted population to expedite and prioritize uh, funds to them. And Governor Walsh had said that we should be ready to support them in any way we can. Um, there's also proposed enhancement to the bill, if you would consider it or have some way of incorporating it in the use of NOAA funds, which is to expedite and prioritize the funds to seniors and persons with disabilities and the targeted populations. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And the intention for this would be to lay it over. So I know if there was any additional feedback, I'm sure Leader Murphy would be um, happy to hear that. Thank you. Do we have one more testifier? If you could please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. My name is Kim Voss, and I am a member of the HRA in Plymouth. I'm not speaking on behalf of the HRA. I'm, uh, I have my own business. I'm an affordable housing development consultant. But I come here really for personal reasons, not professionally or as a member of the HRA. We live in an 81 condo, 81 unit condominium building in Plymouth. Um, it's, it's very, it was built in 1978. There's lots of original equipment still there. We need to replace uh, the exterior, it's stucco. That's very expensive. We're, our elevator repair man says, you know, put it in your budget for a new elevator very soon. Um, the exercise room is smells of mold. It's it's in but it's in bad shape. It needs work. Um, as you know, there are not local funds available uh, to help us. So I'm you know testifying in support of having you know having the HRA be able to designate funds to support this. Um, we're seniors. We're SNAP recipients. Um, most of the Occupants of the building are also seniors who have lived there for a long time. 
there's a number of renters. Um, but I just want to speak to the need for this and I want to support the bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no further testi uh, testifiers on the bill, um, Senator Murphy, any final comments before we go to questions? I um, just want to say thank you for making time to hear this important legislation, and I suspect uh, this is an issue that we will hear more about as we continue to wrestle with affordable housing and naturally occurring, occurring affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Members, are there any questions? See no, Senator Jasinski. Madam Chair, sorry, I just so listening to it, and I, I was in property management for for many many years, and still am. Um, so you know, looking at the you know the the, the people in the the demographics of the building uh, in rural Minnesota, that hits the same demographics that live in single family homes as well. And if you take you know roughly 3.25 million, divide by 230 units, that's 14,130 roughly. If it was just a straight wide assessment. Um, and we have many people in my community that have, they're in homes like that, and if they have a roof replacement or windows, they're in that same category, needing those same needs. So what is the difference, or why would we be doing this and not other homes, again, in, in districts like mine that you know, don't have a big unit, 250 units like this, but they're struggling with the same issues? Um, you know, and, and whether I, the association has put money away for reserves or those things, I don't know the percentages that put away, but when I managed my uh, townhome association, we had to put so much money away in reserves to cover those things. And I guess my question is, you know, why would we be doing this one? And I understand the need, don't get me wrong, I want to make sure you know, understand that, but if we're doing it for this, what about other residents in Minnesota that are in their single family homes that, that meet these same criteria? Social security is their main uh, source of income, uh, mental, physical disabilities. The same thing happens in all our single family homes throughout our, all of our districts, I believe. So what is the difference here versus a single family home in any one of our districts? Is why would we be funding this and not others or allowing that for HRA funds to go to that? So uh, it's just my question. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Jasinski. As I alluded to, I don't believe that this is the last time that we will be wrestling with this issue. Um, and perhaps it is right for us to be thinking about an aging population, both in the metro and in uh, rural districts across the state, and, and recognizing that if their home becomes in, disres in disrepair, they may not have another place to go that is affordable. And what we have found in this situation with the group of people that are living here is if they do lose this place that they're living in, which is affordable and they own, um, there isn't a suitable place for them to go. Um, and so I don't mean to say this and not uh, people in the district you represent, but instead perhaps we are at the front edge of an issue that we're gonna have to wrestle with, especially because we know we have a baby boom generation, um, people who are living longer, um, disproportionately in greater Minnesota, um, and we're gonna have to pay attention to that. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, I just I, I struggle with it because it's needed across. And, and again, I don't know what the reserves are at. And we're looking at other bills, and like in the bonding bill, uh, getting uh, state projects uh, have, make them put money aside to to cover for these things. So I guess maybe it's my question for the association is: Is there was there has there been money being set aside for these replacements over the time, or has that been underfunded while you're here today? Because it's it's comes to a management position uh, to be make sure you're strong enough to manage it to put those that money away so. That you don't have these issues, uh, you know, coming up where, where the state has to step in and fund that because basically they're all privately owned. It's a condo association. I understand that, um, but as I said, it it applies to many, many, many homeowners across the state. The same thing, and if we're doing it here, um, you know, the, we're picking winners and losers where we're going to stick this money at because I, I think every you know I've been on the bonding committee for eight years and you look at the same thing. It's these issues of seniors that are in their homes that can't afford a water or sewer assessment or if you're increasing their taxes for water and sewer rates because you need a new wastewater treatment plant. It's the same issue in, in a condo in, in metro Minnesota versus a single family home in rural Minnesota. And this really just applies to here. So again, I, I hate to pick winners and losers, but all of our citizens are struggling from these same issues. So why are we doing this one and not looking at a program for everything? And that opens up a can of worms. It's like being on the bonding committee and, and funding one fire station, you're gonna fund 400 of them. So it's the same thing of where we're going. So it's just a question that arises because it really does rely on the homeowners and the, and the condo association's responsibility to plan for these things. So 
but I understand the need. I, I totally under, I want to make sure I'm sympathetic on that, but you have to look at it from all different areas of housing and regions of the state. And, and Chair Jasinski and Howard Ornstein. Um, so there, there are a couple of levels that I can answer the question, but I mean, on one level, they're just, there's not the financial capacity within this association to pay for a project like this, even if they had been setting aside reserves. But to your specific question about reserves, yes, um, there are assessments every year for reserves. They build up um, the reserves. They spent over $3 million in the past two years, I believe, on various projects from the reserves. The Windows project was in the reserve study, as is required by law to have a reserve. You're familiar with, with all this. I, I can see you nodding. Um, so they did put money aside for it. When they went to get the bids, I mean, you, you know that the condo association itself doesn't do the reserve study. They have other, it's contracted out. And so um, when the bids came in for this project, I believe it was three to four times the magnitude of what the reserve study, which they did, <laughs> and which they reserved for, had estimated for this project. So it's not that they didn't do a reserve study, it's not that they didn't have reserves, it's not that they didn't, they didn't try to plan for it, it's just this costs way, way more than the reserve study said and that they have the capacity to fund. Thank you for your answer. Uh, go ahead. I can um, give a response to Senator Jasinski, Madam Chair. Um, the, on, on, on my local HRA and in many local HRAs, there are CDBG funds that are available for individual homeowners, like you were referring to. They are not available for a condominium association. And um, so that, that's one resource. Another resource is the, the MHFA also has affordable uh, loans and forgivable loans for homeowners that they can use to maintain and repair their homes. So there are some other resources, but condo buildings do not have another resource. Thank you for the added context. Seeing no further questions, Senate, uh, Senator Murphy, any final comments? Thank you for hearing this today. With that, Senate File 4678 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Murphy, if you could stay with us and at your convenience, we have Senate File 4346. And there will be both an A5 and an A6 amendment uh, that will end up being offered. So what is being passed out right now to everyone is the A6. And you should have the A5 in your packet already. Senator Murphy, at your convenience. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And if I could get a copy of the A5, I just want to make sure. I believe I have it, but I think I have the A2 from earlier, which I believe is the same as the A5. Um, Madam Chair and members, uh, Senate File 4346 is legislation uh, that will give us an opportunity, along with Minnesotans, uh, to put our fingers or our hands around better the costs of health care in the state of Minnesota. It is legislation that uh, is the work product uh, in partnership with Senator Dietzik and myself. Um, I'm really really proud of the opportunity to bring uh, to you uh, this legislation. Uh, and the A5 amendment is a delete all amendment, uh, putting the bill in the proper order and perhaps a member of the committee could move the A5 amendment to have the bill before us. Thank you. Senator Morrison moves the A5 amendment to get the bill in the order that the author would like. All in favor of the A5 amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Senator Murphy. And thank you, Madam Chair. And I heard um, Leader Dietzik's voice. Um, it's nice to be in the committee with Leader Dietzik. Um, the A6 amendment um, is also an important amendment to add before we start the discussion of the bill. Uh, 
it would do two things um, to the, the, the bill before us now as amended. Uh, it would set a threshold uh, for the accountable healthcare entities. Uh, so those earning revenue of $5 million a year or less would not be subject to the provisions in this legislation. Um, that is one part of the amendment. The second part of the amendment on page four, line 27, it would change the word coalition to collaborative. So it would read, uh, appointed by the birth justice collaborative. Thank you. Senator Morrison would also move the A6 amendment. All in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Senator Murphy, I think that's all in order. If you could please explain. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I appreciate that. I'm going to invite Auditor uh, Blaha to join me here uh, briefly. Uh, so that she and I can talk together about um, this piece of legislation, but in its simplest terms, uh, this is legislation that creates a health care commission made up of Minnesotans and advisors to take a look at the, if you will, the uh, experiences that we are having with the health care system um, and to give the legislature, uh, based on the recommendations of the commission, uh, advice and guidance on how we may uh, do the job that I believe that we are asked to do and that we expect of ourselves. This is legislation um, to change the trajectory of our health care system. And because there is so much public funding um, in our health care system, whether it is in tax preferences, um, subsidies for insurance companies, reimbursements, uh, direct payments, grants, um, there are many, many ways in which there are public dollars flowing through our healthcare system. We have a public and private system, but it isn't always clear that we know where those public dollars are going. And when I listen to Minnesotans over the course of the summer in particular, um, when I uh, went out to question them about how they were experiencing our healthcare system, what I heard most often was, I am spending a lot of money for my coverage. And we know that Minnesotans are well covered. There was just another news story about the low rate of uninsured people in the state of Minnesota. But people do have, with their coverage, uh, still enormous out-of-pocket costs in such a way that they're not necessarily able to afford meaningful care. In addition to that, uh, we are seeing consolidations of the system in different parts of the state. So in parts of greater Minnesota and in the urban core, we're seeing consolidating systems that mean people living in different parts of the state don't have access to meaningful care. Um, I could spend time talking to you about some of the things that I heard from the people of Minnesota, but my guess is you've heard them yourself, um, yourselves in that um, Minnesotans, I think, are talking a great deal about what they're experiencing uh, with the current health care system. And so there are two parts to this legislation. We create first um, the, uh, the means by uh, the state auditor to review accountable health care entities uh, to make sure, and this is an issue of transparency, the funding that we are appropriating to these health care facilities, to these entities, are going to their meaning, their intended purposes. And then two, an uh, auditor working with the health commission and with Minnesotans exploring with duties starting on page 7, 7.7, 7, uh, the, the intervening actions that are happening on the part of the industry that are at times serving their interests at the expense of Minnesotans' interest. Uh, I believe uh, that we are charged with the responsibility of making sure people have access to meaningful care, uh, and we are spending a fair amount of the public's dollars on that goal, and yet Minnesotans are telling us that they're not getting access to meaningful care. I think that is something I feel a great deal of concern about, and I would expect others do as well. I have faith in the people of Minnesota and their ability to take a look at the information that we're asking them to review and to come back with recommendations. And when I was a very, very young Minnesotan here working uh, as a nurse and then working for the Nurses Association, we embarked on a similar journey by creating a health care commission back in 1988 and 89 that sent Minnesotans out on a journey 
uh, to talk with the people. They were trying to understand the problems of cost and access. And after two years of work, that commission came back to the legislature. And that work led to the creation of Minnesota Care, which has been since 1992 a durable and reliable means of coverage for the people of Minnesota. Um, it's still serving the people of Minnesota. And it's why I believe it's time for us to do that same thing again. The then executive director of that commission, his name was Jim Koppel. He's recently retired from the Department of Human Services. And I spent time with him this summer and fall, talking with him about his experience with that commission, what, what happened when Minnesotans were engaged in trying to solve a problem. And those recommendations were brought back to the legislature. And he urged me to proceed. He said, keep pushing on the door until it opens. Minnesotans are experiencing real problems with the healthcare system. We are putting a lot of public money into a system. Minnesotans aren't necessarily getting the care that we need. We hear a lot about that from our providers in particular. Um, and others are, are doing very, very well um, financially as a result of that. According to CMS, in 2022, Americans spent $4.5 trillion on health care. That's $13,493 per person. It's 17.3% of our GDP, significantly higher than the rest of the world. In short, in the United States and in Minnesota, we spend a lot on health care. Legislative appropriations to Minnesota's health care entities are made without competitive bidding or auditing and with minimal reporting. We know how much the state pays health care entities to provide care but we have no way of knowing how much money is going to the people who need care and how much is being eaten up by company overhead. This bill is not meant to vilify healthcare entities in Minnesota. It's the opposite. I know personally that there are good people working for them and they help people access medical care, but that doesn't mean that we should continue to aid a failing system. This bill is about transparency. It's about discovery. It's about collecting needing information so that the commission can provide the legislature with quality recommendations that actually address the rising cost within the healthcare system. The commission's work is about discovery and we can't fix a system that we don't understand. The commission will follow the complex web of corporations, administrative hurdles, network constraints, and cultural biases in the system that forced too many Minnesotans into delaying care or avoiding care altogether. I know that there is a person here from Albert Lee wanting to testify in this legislation, and I'm really grateful to be joined by Auditor Blaha. Auditor, thank you for coming today. If you could uh, please state your name and title for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Mitchell. Uh, Chair Dietzik, uh, Lead Anderson, members of the committee, uh, I'm Julie Blaha, your state auditor, and I'm here to speak in, in, in favor of uh, Senate File 4346 uh, because, you know, when I uh, tell people our office has a government information division, uh, the first question I usually get is, are you watching health care? What can you tell me about health care? What can you tell me about the bills? What can you tell us about where our money is going? Um, can you analyze these companies' choices, those kind of things? So I do know that this is the kind of analysis that Minnesotans want. This is the kind of numbers people want to be thinking about. Now, I know that data will have a key role in the success of this commission, and we're you know, available to serve in any role we need to. Um, after reading uh, the amendments, talking with the authors, I believe the kind of role might look something like this. Uh, data collection and analysis similar to, in form to our asset forfeiture report where we pull a number of different types of data together and, and analyze trends. Um, and I think the scale would be similar to our city, county, town, and town financial reports combined. Now, uh, of course, this is something that will be new uh, for our office. And so one of the things that we have uh, asked, again, the author, and she and is considering looking at that implementation date, um, you know, ideally, I think we'd have to hear from the commission. You know, what's the data, what are their data needs? Um, you know, meet with healthcare entities to understand what data already has and where it is. Uh, build those forms. Also, iron out any jurisdictional issues. Um, as somebody who is quite sensitive to my jurisdiction, I understand any other auditors or department agencies who are sensitive to theirs. So uh, I think there is that discussion that also uh, we would definitely want to have. So, but, but I can tell you this, uh, no matter exactly how exactly it looks when it all shakes out, um, I know this is information people want, and I believe that it will be, uh, if it is uh, more deeply organized and analyzed, will have a benefit to the whole system. Thank you. 
Thank you, Auditor Blaha. Um, and we also have on the list Ms. Jackson. On. You, who is virtual. Um, if you could turn your microphone off and proceed, uh, state your name for the record, please. Turn your microphone on. My name is Jeannie Jackson, and I am one of the leaders of Rural Organizing Project of Isaiah, Minnesota. The first thing I'd like to do is thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for willing to let me speak and tell you my story. Um, I'm also a licensed social worker, and one of my code of ethics is that I feel like I should always try to write injustices. This is why I'm grateful for this opportunity. In 1997, Mayo Clinic merged with the Albert Lee Navy Behavioral Health Hospital. They informed us how this was going to enhance our medical um, availability and our medical services here. By 2017, Mayo announced um, that its inpatient, all inpatient services were going to be going through Austin, Minnesota. And over that 10 year period, they slowly dismantled our full service hospital to where now for the most part, we are just a transition station where we get transitioned to other places. A year ago, in April of 2023, I found a lump in my right breast. I made a call to the Mayo Clinic in Albert Lee, which is my hometown, and requested a mammogram. That was on a Tuesday afternoon. I was told that I would get a call back. Six days later, I did not hear anything. And I called on Monday again and was told that I would get a call back that week and that they apologized. I waited another week and I still had not heard anything. I took my 83 year old mother to her doctor appointment and after her appointment, I looked at her nurse and I said, I know this was my mom's appointment, but I need some help. And I explained that I had found a lump in my breast and that it seemed like it was changing and growing. She pulled up my records and stated that I should hear something for sure by Wednesday. Well, Wednesday came and went and again, I hadn't heard anything. Thursday morning, I called Mercy Hospital in Iowa and I had a mammogram scheduled for Friday. They biopsied it on Monday and found out that I had a very aggressive form of breast cancer. The following week was lots of tests and a week later, I started my chemo. Within that two week period, my tumor grew from a 2.8 to an 8.6. I was told how much the delay certainly hurt me and cost me. In the medical profession, the code of ethics and even for their board of directors should be to do no harm. This really baffles me as because first of all, everybody knows that it's very hard to get medical care in rural Minnesota and why someone would wanna come in and dismantle a hospital that is a full hospital with all services in rural Minnesota, how that is looking at the best interest of patients. The second piece that I question is, regardless of how many cures or drugs and funding that they look for, for these cures and drugs for cancer, everyone knows that one of the biggest keys is early detection. If Mayo Clinic is so busy that they cannot even see their patients in a timely manner, it makes me question what truly are the priorities. Since my journey began, I've had chemo and I had to stop that I had a mastectomy, I've undergone radiation, and I, they've attempted more chemo, which they had to stop. I'm on God's plan, God's timing now, and have the privilege to use my valuable time to talk with you and hoping that I can make a difference for people in the future. My mission of um, writing injustices is right along these lines. I pray that my few minutes of talking with you will resonate with you on how important this work is. People who live in communities like Albert Lee need a commission like what Senator Murphy is proposing so that rural communities have a voice 
and to protect critical health care services. This commission can help save lives, literally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson, for your powerful testimony. Uh, Chair Murphy, or I'm sorry, Leader Murphy, do you have anything else before we proceed to questions? Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm really grateful uh, that the committee is making time for this legislation. As I mentioned before, it is uh, the result of work by Leader Dietzik and myself, and we have affectionately called it, where the heck is our money going, although we don't always say heck. Sometimes we use another word that starts with an F. Um, but anyhow, where the heck is our money going? Um, I think that it is uh, important to acknowledge the work of this legislature and legislatures prior. Um, and having been a part of the legislature for a number of years, uh, we will hear stories from Minnesotans about the problems that they're facing, and we often act on them. This legislature right now is wrestling again with the incredibly difficult issue of prior authorization. Prior authorization was the reason I ran for office when the health insurance companies uh, that were responsible or paying for my mom's care were denying her care while she was dying. And my aunties were pretty ticked. Uh, and they said, you should do something, and I decided to run for office. I know that there are members, including Senator Morrison, who are working now on prior authorization. It's not the first time that we've dealt with that issue. And what I have seen over my years is we make headway on behalf of Minnesotans, whether it is on that issue, on closures and on consolidations, on networks, how they keep people in and on out, on PEEP, the Public Employee Insurance Plan, and health care for educators, and the rising costs that are happening again, even though we put in place competitive bidding. We do important work to try and wrestle with the system, and then the system pushes back. And it is getting bigger, and it's getting more powerful. And while there are small hospitals, and there are small clinics, and there are small group practices, we see more and more of the large um, that are driving more of the decisions, driving more of the market, and often with a blind eye, it appears, to the well-being of the people of Minnesota. That is the thing I'm worried about. Before the session started, I sat in a home with about 25 people who live in the district I represent who are worried about access to mental health care for their children because the place that they had been going to in St. Paul closed. It moved. And they are worried about where they're going to get care for their kids. That is not an uncommon story for us. And if we are doing our jobs for the people of Minnesota, I think this has got to be centered and a part of the work. And I do believe if we invite Minnesotans into the discussion with the commission, give them inquiry and tools to figure out what it is uh, that they're wrestling with, that we will have a better set of recommendations that will give us guidance on how to move forward. And that is the point of this legislation, and I would love your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Murphy. And I will just say, um, uh, Attorney General Ellison had a listening session in my community a couple months ago, and the top thing that I heard mentioned from people was health care. So I know that many people are trying to work on this from many different angles because it's a very important issue. Members. Senator Cran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Murphy, um, one, we've got another task force commission. There was 130, I think, before the last beginning of last year. I think 20 plus 25 were added last year. Another 10 or more added this year. Um, specifically to this one, though, the, this is the Equitable Health Care Commission. Last year, the legislature created the Equitable Health Care Task Force. And in 2018, the legislature created the Health Equity Advisory and Leadership Council. How many more commissions do we need that have focused on the same issue in addition to, we already have, right, we have the Department of Health and Human Services, we have thousands of people that are there to look out, review, and analyze the entire healthcare network. And so why would this one be any different? Because this centers Minnesotans, Madam Chair, I'm Senator so sorry, Murphy. because this centers Minnesotans. It puts them at the table, um, not us and not necessarily experts. There are experts there with them, but the voting members are Minnesotans from across the state of Minnesota. We know that we are experiencing geographic disparities. We're experiencing disparities based on wealth or income. We're experiencing disparities based on race and ethnicity. Uh, we know that there are problems with our healthcare system. Uh, I think it is important that Minnesotans drive this discussion for us for a little while, because they're the ones who are telling us that there is a problem um, and I think their voices together are powerful, 
in such a way that we would be able to overcome some of the barriers that we're facing in this side, inside this Capitol right now. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Cran. Senator Murphy, you just described what every task force commission and the voice of the people, and, and we've seen those, but rarely is it truly the average citizen. And so it's typically a ideology, ideologically aligned um, activist. Um, you've, you've got the whole host of union members. It appears that it's another group to go after. But when, one, when you look at the membership, another 20 member council or commission, um, you look at the, the volume of the membership is, is troubling. But I don't know, I just don't see how, how any of this will will improve any aspect of it. So I'll, I'll move on to uh, um, kind of one of our other questions is, this really assigns um, authority to the Office of the State Auditor in, in uh, responsibility or, or entities now having to report or that financial reviews would be required by the State Auditor. Um, are those reviews required to be performed by the State Auditor or just to be reported up to the State Auditor? Uh, Auditor Blaha. Thank you, Chair Mitchell, and thank you, Senator Coran. Yeah, that was a, kind of our discussion, too. Um, it's, uh, I think you had, if you see us all trying to audit every entity, I think you realize that would be un un unachievable. Uh, so my understanding is that what people are looking for is more collection of data, making sure the data is there, and having that in a way that people can access. So again, it's less about us going out and actually doing investigations, doing audits, it's about us doing more like the data collection. And, and that's why I use the example of our forfeiture report. We are not going out and, you know, uh, we're not auditing how they collect forfeiture data. We simply pull the data together in a way that you can analyze and give it back to you so you can make decisions uh, on it. So yes, I'm not seeing this as uh, my understanding, this is not a situation where we're going out and auditing private entities. That's not what we would be doing. It's merely pulling data and giving you um, an overview and analysis of the numbers, but it is not about going out and doing investigations like that. Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Coran. Auditor Baha, I don't, I don't see in the legislation, so who will determine the criteria and the data required to be reported? So, um, Auditor Blaha. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Mitchell and Senator Corrant. So I think that this is where uh, we talk about what is the data we're going to collect, and that's why one of the reasons we were asking to say, hey, you would want to uh, possibly implement this part of it, right, the data collection, after the, uh, the commission has met for a bit, so that you're seeing what are their data needs. So it's the idea of what data do they need, um, hearing what kind of analysis they're trying to do, and then working with the entities uh, in any place else where the data resides to say, all right, how do we pull that data in, in a way that can be um, better utilized? So, uh, so I don't want to just right now say, we're going to have everybody send everything into us. It's the idea of we need to understand what that commission is looking for to make decisions and then build the report off of that. Again, very much like we do our other reports, our municipal liquor store report, we build that on stakeholder discussion and pull that data based on what people need to make analyses. So that's uh, how we would approach this as well. Madam Chair. Senator Coran. And Auditor Baja, so yeah. um, how many other entities do you, does the state auditor's office collect that out, um, where you're collecting non-financial information? Mm. Auditor Blaha. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Chair Mitchell and Senator Coran. So when we're talking about I know I have a person in the room that might be helping you too, but uh, if I think about the things that are not directly local government budget data, maybe as I think maybe what your question is, uh, we have the municipal liquor store report. We have the um, we have the again the uh, asset forfeiture report. Um, I believe there are a couple other things too that we do, and it's been things that are often sent to us where the data is complex um, and uh, has a connection to government uh, and wants us to, to advertise that. So those are two that jump out me right now that are the ones that are not the typical budget data. Uh, oh, tax increment finance, I think you could also argue that tax increment finance division is also outside of, again, basic city, county, government, um, mere, uh, mere um, uh, uh, financial data. So tax increment finance, oh, let me add one more thing, our pension division, we are collecting a significant amount of data on um, fire relief associations 
and uh, similar types of pension plans. So often we have these new divisions that come in when there is an issue that people have wanted an added level of analysis. So again, particularly pension and tax increment finance are the two divisions that are probably the best indicators of entire divisions that were based on that. But we do do some other things through our government information division as well. M Manager? And, and thank Grant. you, Auditor Baja. The, the concern I have is we already have the, um, this jurisdiction or all, all the jurisdictions, anybody who has um, the receipt of state dollars, which is practically anybody who, who is in healthcare and, and the entities we described today. What I'm worried about is, is that, that this jurisdiction is already covered under the Office of the, of the Legislative Auditor. And so if we were actually looking to do something that was performance-based, one, financial, two, which is what, you what, which is what your primary focus is, and in, in this case, we're really looking for uh, performance or outcome matrix, right? That's, I think, what the stated goal is. Your focus in the agency is typically financial and, and compliance with financial audits. But you've opened the window based on, well, we'll just accept whatever the commission has and whatever data. Um, which has, which to me is unfortunate. We have no bounds um, to what is what burden is going to be placed on all of our healthcare providers um, to accommodate that need. In addition to, I think if we were going to go out and have a group analyze not only the financial aspect and the accountability, which we all agree on for every state dollar, but to be able to put forth and measure outcomes or to provide guidance in how that work or that information would be able to measure outcomes. The Office of the Legislative Auditor is far more prepared in, in, to do those types of reviews and audits. So to me, if that, I, I just don't like the fact that we're transferring new duties to the Office of the, of the State Auditor. Um, and I think it should remain in the jurisdiction or boundaries within the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Senator Blaha, or I'm sorry, Auditor Blaha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Mitchell, Senator Coran. Uh, I, I think, uh, again, I could really nerd out on this for a really long time, and I know that's what you came here for. But the, uh, the idea of um, do we have the capacity to do performance audits? We do, um, in fact, have uh, authority to do that kind of a thing. And I think what um, I am less concerned, I, to be honest, about who actually ends up doing this. If it does come to a situation where you think, you know what, hey, it would make sense, more sense with a legislative auditor, I could understand that. One thing that we do more often than the legislative auditor does is things where we're collecting data every single year, putting together a report and giving it back. We are, you know, they don't have reports like our county report, our county report. They don't have reports like our forfeiture report. So there, that's where I think our, um, our benefit might be. Um, and um, and do we and a lot of the state work actually goes uh, I mean healthcare uh, stuff also goes through local government which we do have a connection with so we spend a lot of time looking at MA and things like that as we do local government audits especially at the county level so um, again I'm not entirely um, uh, uh, married to the idea that it has to be my office versus any I think it should be somebody's office but I want to at least give us that uh, I believe that it, we have a nexus there. However, if, uh, if we decided that uh, that is an issue, I mean, I, I'm open to that discussion. Madam Chair, I just have one quick, one last follow-up. Um, Senator Graham. Uh, Senator Murphy, um, how many entities are we talking about that follow in after you've scaled down to the $5 million revenue um, limit? How many entities do we think that is? Over 1,000. Before we offered the amendment, it was around 1,100. Um, but I don't know uh, this, this afternoon, now that we've amended the bill, what that number is. But Thank you. We could safely say, you know, that many. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Majority Leader Murphy. Um, this is the second time I get to hear this bill today. <laughs> um, and without being redundant, I, I want to thank you for, for bringing this forward. Thank you for being here, um, Auditor Blaha, and for making us laugh as ever. Um, I think that, I guess I see this more as kind of a transparency effort. We know a couple of things. We know that we're spending a ton of money on healthcare and it grows every year. We also know that our outcomes are getting worse. So what's going on here? Healthcare can't solve all of those problems and obviously it has a role. So, you know, if you look at even the past couple of decades, there are all kinds of new healthcare entities that have been born. Pharmacy benefit managers. In the paper just uh, two days ago, this was in the New York Times about this entity called Multiplan. I had never heard of this before. This um, sounds like a really admirable 
organization that um, its private equity backed firm has helped drive down payments to medical providers, drive up patients' bills, and earn billions for insurers. So, for example, United Health Group, our very own, um, has apparently received um, to the tune of about a billion dollars in fees a year through this multi plan entity. So, as we look at how are we going to, I think we all agree we want to spend less on health care. But we also want people to be healthier. So where is all of this money going? And I think that this effort will help us understand potentially where, and maybe this is how we want to spend our healthcare dollars. Maybe, maybe we do want to spend our money on multi-plan. Um, I suspect that that's not true for most of us. Um, but I think having more transparency, gathering this information um, could be very useful. And, and I appreciate the effort to have the voices of um, everyday Minnesotans around the table sharing their experiences. We need to hear people's lived experiences. Um, so thank you for the effort. Um, I appreciate the amendment because I don't think the small clinics are probably the drivers of this. Um, and adding to their administrative burden is, is challenging. So I appreciate that amendment. But um, Let's keep talking and working on this. I think you're on to something. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Senator Morrison. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Murphy, for bringing this. I was um, going to bring up multi-plan as well. I read that New York Times investigation, horrified, but not surprised. And my colleague, Senator Morrison, is, is so um, kind in the way that she talks about the healthcare system. I'm pissed about it. It is horrible. The way that we treat patients, how much money we are spending to line the pockets of wealthy people to not give us care, to tell us why we don't need the care our doctor prescribed us, to tell us that we should try something different even though they've never met us or our doctor, have no idea what's going on with us. The number of times I've had to argue with an insurance company about a two-year-old's inhaler is insane. And as many things as we can do to continue to get our hands and our arms around this, to keep our money or put it towards making us healthy. And what we're gonna to continue to find over and over again is that a healthcare system whose main goal is to make people profit is they will continue to find new ways to make profit. And so until we remove the overall goal of our healthcare system for profit making, instead of to make and keep people healthy, we're gonna keep ending up back here. I, I'm seeing these commissions from the 80s and the 90s that revolutionized how we provided healthcare and helped us save money, and now we have to do this again. And what are they going to come up with in 20 years? To take more of our money, to line more people's pockets, to give us less health care, to tell us what we should do differently that they've never met us, to tell a two-year-old she doesn't need an inhaler because she has asthma. Can she take a pill? Um, so I'm, I'm really appreciative of this work. I'm really appreciative that we've created these places for Minnesotans to be involved because the more often we can bring Minnesotans to the work and tell us what needs to be fixed and be part of that fix, the better the work is. Um, but I have had it up to here with insurance companies in particular, with the profit motivation of our healthcare system. Um, it is doing nobody good. And so I hope that this is the last time we have to do something like this because again, I, I'm just, I'm a pissed off mom right now and I will continue to be until we have a different kind of healthcare system. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple questions and, and part of it goes to, I'd like to just ask about the $5 million, why on the amendment is the 5 million the cutoff point or is that significant in any way to yes. start? Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Lang. Uh, we listened carefully to the committee that heard this this morning in Health and Human Services. This has been a dual track piece of legislation. So it was in Health and Human Services going to judiciary uh, and we're here. Uh, in particular for uh, the provisions around the work of the, um, the equitable uh, or the, the entities. Um, so what we heard this morning uh, from members of the Health and Human Services Committee is we have some very consolidated and large entities like United Health Group and then a number of small. And in fact, there are a couple of members of that committee, uh, Senator Abler and Senator Liskey, who are both talking about their own practices and it's clear that we should draw a line. That's where we drew the line. It's somewhat arbitrary, um, five million, um, but we want to recognize um, the difference between the large and consolidating entities and the ones that um, are below that line and get after the problem of uh, the significant power resting in those that have consolidated and become so large. 
Thank, Thank you, you Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I guess I've um, been working pretty hard the last few years on a lot of EMS uh, providers, so I'm assuming that they fall into the 1100 uh, that would be uh, fall under your jurisdiction really on this one. So, um, and there's no fiscal note attached to this. So I'm curious when it comes to these audits, uh, I don't know if there's such a thing as a local impact. I guess it'd be more of a business impact statement. Um, but there, there has to be some sort of a cost. So all these EMS providers that we've been working so hard for the last couple of years are now going to have an additional cost, I'm assuming, uh, as to the rate and frequency uh, of these audits. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's tough to see. But, uh, yeah, if you could respond to that. Auditor Blaha. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lang. Let's be clear. These aren't audits. Uh, we aren't, they, we aren't they, they talk about an examination, and one of the things that I also talked, again, with the authors is the idea that we can, we're pulling data, that this is not going to be us going in, doing an engagement where we would be charging a local entity. So when I look at, for instance, what we would be looking at for staffing, I'm not looking at staffing something like this with CPAs. I'd be staffing them with data analysts. So this is, a, but now will there be extra costs for additional reporting? Yeah, I think there will be, but it certainly would not be at the level that you would see if it were an audit or some limited engagement or something like that. Thank Great you, Great question, though. Okay. So there's additional see, cost. Oh. <laughs> I, I, again, yeah. there may be, but again, to the level of what additional okay. um, reporting would be. Um, and again, they already do some reporting, so it wouldn't be all like brand new. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Seeing no further questions or comments, Senate File 4346, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank, thank you both for your work on this. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. We will not now take Senate File 5354 off the table. Senator Diedzik, um, or the last item that we had before we tabled this bill was an amendment offered, the A4 amendment offered by Senator Gustafson. Um, everyone should now have the A2 amendment, which was already adopted, and the A4 um, amendment would amend some parts of that. So Senator Gustafson, now that everyone has what they need to look at, could you please describe your amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. So the A4 amendment eliminates the provisions of SF 5354 as amended that deal with stadium gambling, gaming, sorry, gaming. The Racing Commission approved these games in 2018. They are currently in operation at Running Aces. I represent a district very close to Running Aces and we have heard from stakeholders about the concerns about limiting these games since they are already in play. I'm offering this amendment to keep the bill focused on only the historic horse racing machines. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Are there any questions or comments? Senator Dietzik, as the author, um, could you please comment on the amendment? Um, thank you, Chairman Schull. Um, and thank you, Senator Gustafson, for authoring, offering this amendment. Um, this is a friendly amendment. We, we you know, the, what happened in the past is what happened in the past. We wanna keep this focused on um, the, what I consider the Racing Commission's uh, inappropriate action to expand gambling in the state of Minnesota. So we are just keeping it focused on this recent action so that before. So thank you. Th thank you, Chair. There was a, a brief pause, but before that, we heard most of it, including that this would be a friendly amendment. So Senator Gustafson renews her offer of the A4 amendment, see no further questions. All in favor of adopting the A4 amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed nay. The A4 amendment passes and Senator Dietzik, um, now with the amendments in place, if you could please, um, any further comment to your bill. Um, thank you again. Um, Committee for hearing this is what we're trying to do is, I, as I said earlier, I believe the Racing Commission took an inappropriate action to expand gambling. 
Um, if any of you want to write a bill to expand gambling, that is your prerogative as legislators. The legislature has the authority to expand gambling, not the Racing Commission. And so this just puts a halt to that um, inappropriate action before it goes too far. So um, with that, I will stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you so there might much. Be some testifiers too. So yes. thank you. Yes. Thank you, Senator Dietzek. Uh, good to see you as always. Um, we do have some testifiers. I know that with the amendment, perhaps not everyone still intends to testify. Um, and we also have just a half hour left of committee. So uh, the first names I have on the list are Andy Plato and Leah Patton. If you still intend to testify, if you could please come forward and Mr. Meeks would be on deck. Again, uh, any effort to be concise would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, Mr. Plato, I assume. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Andy Plato, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Minnesota Indian Gaming Association, or MIGA. MIGA is currently made up of nine of the 11 federally recognized tribes within the state of Minnesota. On behalf of MIGA tribal leaders, thank you for the opportunity to comment on Senate File 5354. MIGA leaders appreciate the legislature's recognition that HHR games are not contemplated anywhere in current law, and an appointed body like the Minnesota Racing Commission does not have the authority to expand gambling in Minnesota. Gambling policy is the business of this body and the full legislative branch, and all 201 members should be alarmed that your role as lawmakers has been hijacked. Racing commissioners, we're provided the AGE letter in your packets long before last Monday's vote. Commissioners knew that state regulators affirm these games as illegal gambling devices, just like slot machines, not as paramutual horse racing, and thus in no way under the Racing Commission's authority. Then, Executive Director Gustafson reminded members that any action on the track's request before tribal consultation would violate Minnesota Statute 1065, and the Commission acted in defiance of that council. In other words, after decades of debate at the Capitol on this very topic, the Commission decided to deliberately circumvent legislative authority and unilaterally authorize slot machines at the state's horse tracks. Tribes have an inherent sovereign right to operate and offer gaming affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Commercial racetracks do not. Furthermore, gaming revenues serve as the essential source of money that funds tribal governments, tribal communities, and the services indigenous Minnesotans rely on. Today, a significant amount of those revenues come from video slot machines, devices that are virtually identical from a player's perspective to the so-called HHR machines proposed by racetracks and illegally approved by the Racing Commission one week ago. In short, video gaming expansion, like HHR, greatly threatens the health of the tribal gaming industry that is not only critical to tribes and their governmental and cultural responsibilities, but also to Minnesota's rural economy. Senate File 5354 is a reasonable and appropriate response to prevent further unauthorized and illegal actions on these topics, and its passage rightfully protects the legislature's authority as Minnesota's sole lawmaking body. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Patton and uh, Mr. Meeks, if you could please come forward and go ahead and sit at the table when you're getting ready so we can just keep this moving. Thank you. Ms. Patton, uh, please state your name for the record and then proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair members, my name is Leah Patton. I am Executive Director of the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition. JRLC is a statewide coalition formed through the partnership of our sponsoring faith organizations, which are the Islamic Center of Minnesota, the Jewish Community Relations Council, the Minnesota Catholic Conference, and the Minnesota Council of Churches. As people of faith, we advocate alongside our neighbors of differing religious backgrounds to address poverty, uphold the dignity of overlooked communities, and mitigate societal harm. So I am here to testify in favor of Senate File 5354. Um, we, JRLC doesn't support um, any type of gambling expansion because of the societal harm that religious communities see um, 
from gambling addiction and problematic gambling behaviors every day in the work that they do in their communities. Um, and we're particularly concerned with gambling expansion that hasn't gone through the legislative process where the potential societal impact can be discussed and mitigated um, by you as the elected representatives of our um, citizens. Um, so speaking specifically to historic horse racing, um, these machines are nearly identical in form and function um, to slot machines, and they should be regulated um, in the same way as gambling devices. Um, the bill also makes it completely clear that historic racing is not classified as a form of peri-mutual betting um, like in-person horse racing is, um, and it also clarifies uh, the Racing Commission's purview to ensure that the unilateral gambling expansion that happened last Monday won't happen again. Um, and honestly, in our opinion, to believe that current state law would not classify these machines as gambling devices stretches credulity. And um, if simply swapping out an algorithm for a slightly different algorithm makes something not a slot machine or not a gambling device, then our, st our state effectively has no gambling regulations at all. So we want to um, thank Senator Dietzik for taking this seriously and for acting very quickly. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, if Mr. Bremer could come forward and Mr. Meeks, if you want to proceed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Jack Meeks and I'm chairman of the Citizens Against Gambling Expansion in Minnesota. We are a statewide Minnesota nonprofit organized over 20 years ago to stop the expansion of gambling in our great state. Recently, we became aware of a potential and massive expansion of gambling when the Minnesota Racing Commission began consideration of adding a thousand slot machines to the state's two horse race tracks. Those slot machines would feature historic horse racing games. The machines are purposely designed to mimic typical slot machines. A player's experience is essentially identical to that provided by slot machines. The machines are cons under considerations look like slot machines, act like slot machines, and any reasonable evaluation are slot machines. If the two tracks are allowed to place a thousand slot machines in Running Aces and Canterbury Park, it will represent one of the largest expansion of gambling in Minnesota history. The Minnesota legislature has sole authority to regulate gambling in this state and must carefully and appropriately use this oversight authority. The unlawful action that happened last week at the Minnesota Racing Commission cannot be allowed to stand, lest other organizations or appointed boards attempt to do the same thing, to install slot machines anywhere in the state without legislative approval. National and international studies have shown slot machines to be the most addictive form of gambling. We do not believe that the appointed Minnesota Racing Commission nor any other appointed body has the authority to expand gambling in any form. We believe that you, the members of the Minnesota legislature, determine gambling policy in this state. This is a massive expansion of gambling. Our coalition members strongly encourage this committee to pass this bill so that any others attempting to unlawfully expand gambling will be stopped in their tracks and be reminded that there is only one rightful authority to authorize and regulate gambling, and that is here in the Minnesota legislature. This bill is a much needed response to prevent what happened last week at the Minnesota Racing Commission and serves as a warning to any other unauthorized Board of Commission from taking similar action in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, if Tracy Wilson could also come down and come forward, and Mr. Bremer, if you could please state your name and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Richard Bremer. I'm a fourth generation farmer from Lake City, Minnesota. My wife and now my two daughters have successfully run a diversified family farm for 50 years. One of the agricultural businesses that is a part of our family farm is breeding thoroughbred horses. We've done this for 30 years. 
Canterbury Park is a sports venue. Horse owners are sports teams. Horse owners have no connection to Canterbury Park other than to choose Canterbury Park as the venue where their team is going to play. Horse owners can easily move their team to a different venue in another state. They simply need to hire a new coach or trainer in another state, and then they tell their tra new trainer in Minnesota that they're moving, and, and they just apply for a license in a different state, and they put their horse on a trailer, and they leave. Now, the owners pay a trainer about $80 a day per horse to train that. Canterbury has about 1,200 horses on their barns on the backside. So if you multiply 1,200 horses times a 120-day season times $80 a day, that's over $11 million in economic activity that's completely separate from the Canterbury Park Holding Corporation. This is economic activity in addition to the economic activity happening at the, the race that, at Canterbury Park. That's a lot of economic activity. That amount of activity generates a lot of tax revenue for the state of Minnesota. Income taxes, sales taxes, fees, permit. When trainers leave Minnesota, all those jobs, all that tax revenue leaves. Minnesota is letting other states eat our lunch. They're letting us letting this industry and this economic driver and these taxes leave Minnesota and go to other states. Now horse breeders, we produce the new team players. Horse breeders think long term. It takes about four to five years from the time you breed a mare until that horse or that new player is of racing age. Horse breeders need to choose which state they're going to fold that new baby in. Horse breeders will choose a state where they have confidence that the government will support the thoroughbred industry. Horse breeders are losing all confidence that Minnesota state government will support thoroughbred racing. This is why there has been a huge collapse in the number of foals being born in Minnesota. The horse industry in North America is not dying. The horse industry is relocating, relocating to states that support the industry. If this bill passes, no horse breeders in their right mind will fold their mares in Minnesota because it will show that this state is not going to support this industry. No horses, no racing, no racetrack, no economic activity, no taxes for Minnesota, end of game. But hey, it's okay. Minnesota doesn't need any tax revenue from the horse racing industry. There's lots of other taxpayers and lots of other business in Minnesota. We'll just tax them more. Now excuse me for being a little snarky here. This bill is not good for Minnesota. It goes beyond the tax base. The fan base at Canterbury is substantial. Attendance at Canterbury far exceeds that of other racetracks in this country. Horse racing has become a part of our culture. This state, this government, needs to level the playing field between Minnesota and other states. They need to show horsemen that this government cares about the horse racing industry. They need to give this industry the tools or the support so that we regain confidence in horse racing in Minnesota. If you find a way to do that, the horsemen will come back. The horsemen love to race at Canterbury Park. They love the state of Minnesota. Level the playing field, give some confidence to our industry, and we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Wilson. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for having me today. My name is Tracy Wilson, and I am the CFO uh, at Running Aces. So 
I had my testimony prepared today to talk about. Oh, am I you are projecting very well. Uh, if you want to use the handheld, though, I'm it, not going to be able to. Oh, I'm okay. Sorry. Great. Here, let's see if I can get a little. Closer. Just doing options, but you are projecting yeah. very well. You're, Is that it's not right? a problem. You're great. Right. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Um, so anyway, most of my testimony today, thanks to uh, Senator Gustafson's amendment limiting this bill to now one matter, which is what the Minnesota Racing Commission approved last week by a five to one vote after thorough analysis um, of our on track advanced deposit wagering on historical horse racing. So I do want to thank you, um, Senator Gustafson and the rest of you for supporting the amendment. Um, but I do want to clear up some discussion on what's been what's been said about HHR. Um, first, it's not a slot machine. This is not a slot machine. And there is no random number generator in this product. It is 100% pure mutual. And is, it's just like what a customer does today to bet on a race. But this happens to be uh, betting on a past live race at a licensed racetrack. This is a new modern form of parimutuel betting on horse racing. The player wins based solely outcome, based solely on the outcome of the race and their picks. Way different. You go to a slot machine and it's just the luck of the draw. You go to this product, it's a new form of parimutuel betting. The EGED letter that has been mentioned um, earlier, and maybe you've seen that letter, it, it talks about other patents. It's not even the game that we had in front of the Minnesota Racing Commission. This bill was introduced, as I said, after the Minnesota Racing Commission passed by a five to one vote approving a new parimutuel product that can help sustain and grow the racing industry to survive in the 21st century. You heard from the thoroughbred person how much this is needed. We need survival. We need a new form of paramutual. It's the same paramutual as just offering paramutual on a past live horse race. And we need this because all, all the while, video games of chance and the expansion of class three card games offered at tribal casinos under the Tribal Casinos Blackjack Compact and other gaming continue to evolve and expand. If you've been to any of those tribal casinos, you can see how things have evolved and progressed. Um, what, we have, what we have for Paramutual, there's been very minimal upgrades to the product. This new product that we're talking about, this new Paramutual product will have lim will have little impact on tribal casinos, but will have an enormous impact on the racing industry. It represents approximately 1.5% of the tribe's self-reported gaming revenues. While the, legislator is look, while the legislature is looking to pass the biggest expansion in gambling over 30 years and giving it exclusively to tribal casinos, this bill is trying to take away something that the Minnesota Racing Commission approved last week, and it was fully under their authority. It follows the rules and the statutes of Minnesota. Why can't they do this for racing? While well, I appreciate the amendments, I am still urging all of you to please vote no today on passing this bill out of committee. Two things can be true. Tribal casinos can flourish as well as the racing industry. Please don't pick winners and losers. If you haven't been to Running Aces, please come visit us. The passion and the love for horses and entertaining customers is undeniable. Please don't put the racing industry out of business or letting us progress and go forward like everyone else has had, has had the capability of doing. Thank you for your time. I will take any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Sampson, Mr. Revac, if you could come down um, and 
again, any effort to be concise because we are coming up on our 2.30 end time for the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and proceed. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Jesse Preiner, the mayor of the city of Columbus, which is located in Anoka County and home to Running Aces Track and Hotel. But before I begin, I have a little tiny public service announcement. Sharpen your knife before you start chopping carrots. I've got the stitches to prove it. And, ooh. Anyway, down to business. I would like to tell everyone here that Running Aces is a great corporate citizen for both Columbus and all of Anoka County. Running Aces provides between 500 and 600 jobs annually. It is an entertainment venue that is clean, orderly, fun, and offers a great mix of harness racing and the best harness racing in the Midwest. It is also the largest tax contributor to this uh, tax base in Columbus and a major contributor to Anoka County and the state of Minnesota. Annually, Running Aces pays property taxes to the tune about $825,000 a year, in addition to an $85,000 a year hotel use tax all going to the city of Columbus. In addition, they generously contribute 90,000 a year to support our police, our firemen, and the senior citizens of Columbus. But beyond being a great tax generator and a money machine for the city and the county, Running Aces has also proven to be a tremendous community member with sincere generosity and community involvement. Locally, Running Aces contributes to various local youth sports programs and to our Youth Service Bureau, whose mission is keeping kids on the straight and narrow and focused on their futures, as well as supporting our Columbus senior citizens and, of course, our famous Columbus Fall Fest. I am here today to ask you to vote no on the current bill, as it seems it would have a negative impact on the jobs in Columbus, along with the entire horse racing industry in Minnesota. Running Aces is a significant contributor to our state's economy, providing taxpaying jobs to suppliers, staffs, veterinarians, and countless others. If this bill passes, it will cause, I believe it will cause irreparable harm to my city. Please do not do anything that will harm the city of Columbus. Please do not let this happen under your watch. I urge you to vote no on this bill and to protect the jobs and the economic contribution that Running Aces makes to the state and to my city, Columbus. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Sampson, if you could please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Randy Sampson, and I'm the CEO and Chairman of, of uh, Canterbury Park. I'm here today to speak in opposition to this bill. I believe it takes us backward at a time when we need to find ways to boost purses and rebuild the horse racing industry in Minnesota. Um, a lot of, as was said, a lot, you know, number one, I don't want to repeat, as you've requested, a lot of what's already been said, and I also... Uh, a lot of the comments were related to the uh, language that has now been taken out of the bill. Again, we appreciate Senator Gustafson's uh, amendment on that, and which certainly helps. But I, I do still want to make a few points. And I, I realize that the uh, sports betting, mobile sports betting bill is not in front of this committee, but it is, it is an impact on what we're talking about today, that that bill, as was said, is a, will have a significant negative impact. It is the biggest expansion of gambling. Uh, at least since the tribal casinos were uh, the compacts for the tribal casinos and it will have a negative impact and to this point the legislature has uh, not accommodated any uh, help for the racetracks and so we need to find ways to to grow our purses and increase our, our uh, horse racing industry as you heard which is in decline and that nationally horse racing is at a crossroads and states that have implemented strategies to enhance purses are seeing their racing thrive while states that have not supported racing are seeing tracks closed. Uh, we had card room legislation passed in 99 and our 10 year marketing agreement with SMSC are good examples of previous success when everybody works together to find ways to enhance purses and improve the industry. And we believe that Minnesota wants horse racing to thrive but that isn't gonna happen without a thoughtful long-term plan about how gaming will evolve in Minnesota. Uh, our opposition to this bill and our concern about the sports betting bill is that is they are preventing, these bills are preventing Canterbury Park from doing what tracks in other states have been able to do, which is expand our offerings to meet changing customer demand and fund competitive purses. 
Uh, again, I appreciate the uh, uh, amendment to uh, limit this to the HHR, but and I and you know without having fully reviewed that, there may still be some unintended consequences, and we'd like the opportunity to review and and potent and make sure that there aren't. Uh, still some issues, but the, the main issue obviously now is uh, that this bill does prohibit a modernized form of paramutual wagering on horse races, historic horse racing, uh, and prevents us from following a model that has worked uh, to increase purses in other states. As Ms. Wilson said, we, we do believe we, we, that this uh, was a legal action by the Racing Commission and that the, it is a paramutual product and not an uh, illegal gaming device. In, you know, my last comments are that uh, for the last two sessions, our, our uh, message for, as Canterbury Park has been pretty simple, that if we're going to make changes to Minnesota's gaming landscape, let's do it in a way that works for tribal casinos, tracks, and local charities. Let's not pick winners and losers. We believe the broadest economic and community benefit will come from bringing all the parties together and setting a clear direction for, new game, for any new gaming in Minnesota. Unfortunately, that isn't where we are at this point in the session. Instead, the bills are picking who will win, who will lose, and expanding gaming for some, but pro prohibiting for others. If the legislature passes this bill and the current version of mobile sports betting, you are jeopardizing the future of horse racing in Minnesota. Let's find a way to work together on a gaming bill that will benefit all stakeholders in the Minnesota gaming industries. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Rivak. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. The original bill was obviously an overreach that extended well beyond banning HHR. And I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room that doesn't completely understand all the amendments, but I do appreciate them. Why does this bill matter to me? My parents brought me to Canterbury Downs on June 26, 1985. That was opening day. And I was 13 years old and I fell in love with horse racing from that point on. I worked many different jobs at Canterbury in my teenage years. And in 2010, I paid $300 for a share of a thoroughbred that I found on Craigslist to get my career in owning horses started. Today, I have a stable that has 10 horses and 40 partners. We're not wealthy people. We're just a group of Minnesotans who share the love of horse racing and enjoy bringing our families to Canterbury Park to watch our horses run. Three years ago, I joined the MNHBPA, and our motto is horse people helping horse people. In addition, I head up the Canterbury Chaplaincy Council, and I'm a board member of the Leg Up Fund, a nonprofit that cares for injured jockeys, exercise riders, the backside community, and retired racehorses. I've discovered that in addition to raising my two kids, improving the lives of the backside community at Canterbury, Canterbury Park is my second calling in life. Canterbury and the people who work there are my family, my life, and they mean the world to me. Senate File 5354 exacerbates the unlevel playing field that the racetracks already face today. It hurts the backside community. It hurts the programs that have been developed at the tracks, such as the education program Furlong Learning and the therapy program Abijah's on the backside. It hurts the horse owners, breeders, farriers, veterinarians, agricultural suppliers, and many others that participate in this industry that has a half billion dollar a year economic impact to the state of Minnesota. It hurts the hundreds of employees at the racetrack, it hurts the business owners in the communities where the tracks reside, and it hurts Minnesotans, the voters, the people who put you in the positions you're sitting in today. Who is looking out for those people? Who cares about them? If you do, you'll reject SF5354. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Member, questions? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And not really a question, just a comment about how important these uh, tracks are uh, to our state. I've uh, had the uh, fortunate uh, time to uh, go tour Canterbury and to really realize what that does for our state, uh, the jobs it employs, or the people that it employs. Uh, I go on an annual event there with my college uh, uh, friends, and we have a great time uh, there. Uh, it, it's very, very, I think, beneficial to the state. Uh, we were there actually when the, when the Mystic Lake uh, uh, purses were there and it, it made it much more enjoyable. And so I think they're, they're threatened by a changing economy, changing things going on. 
Uh, so I would like to uh, I thank uh, Senator Gustafson for the amendment that uh, takes part of that uh, bad portion out of the bill, but still have concerns to make sure that these facilities uh, can thrive here in Minnesota. Um, I think it's something we should help uh, with, and uh, by doing this bill is not helping them. Uh, as, as the comments have made, everything has evolved at the casinos as well. This is just evolving with technology uh, to do paramutual betting. So uh, I, I, I think we really need to look at what we're doing and, and how it affects uh, these two great facilities we have in Minnesota. A lot of people travel to our state to uh, appreciate what's going on here and see those things. I've had very uh, good interactions with a lot of people there to see what how it affects our state and uh, I think uh, by doing uh, by passing the bill it's going to be a disservice to what we have here already of uh, the jobs that are created the tax base uh, you name it there are so many things it's an economic engine for the entire area and to limit that uh, I would have some concerns with so I uh, do appreciate Senator Gustafson's uh, amendment that makes it somewhat more tolerable uh, but still have some huge concerns of what it's going to do to two facilities as Mr. Sampson mentioned uh, you know with with, chair, or with uh, the betting coming up sports betting that's going to be another thing that's going to be a concern so uh, let's let's appreciate what we have here in Minnesota and let's try and help them thrive so thank you thank you Senator Zinsky. Senator Lang uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I guess this is probably a, a question for Senator Dietzik more than, than maybe a couple of comments here. It's, um, you know, I always get kind of skeptical when, when testifiers come in and say this. This darn commission, they just can't do anything right, right? They're, they're breaking the law. They're doing everything illegal. Um, so I, I go on the website and look at who is on the, sitting on this commission. It doesn't seem like this is a bunch of activists trying to prove a point. I think these are people that probably took a good look at what was brought to them and said, this is probably a good way to go. This is something that's not going to make everybody angry. Um, I don't think this was their intent to end up uh, where the legislature is probably going to try to stop a lawsuit from happening. Um, I, I guess I find it kind of odd that we're in a situation where I'm going to have to vote and my vote's gonna decide whether we have legislation or we have a lawsuit in place. And um, maybe this is just me looking at all these commissions that we're setting up. We set up two other ones earlier today, and now we're not happy with one, so it's, it's an issue. Um, <laughs> but I mean, my, my question maybe to Senator Dietzik is, is, do you think they did this intentionally? Is that, is that why we're here? having a bill in such a short time frame where it was introduced one week here the next week and now we have to have it become law and we're, we're actually kind of pitting senators against each other a little bit here. Um, the horse tracks sure don't seem to have an intent to in, in, you know, inflict any harm upon any of the tribes. However, they still want to have some livelihood in the game. So I guess that's maybe my question to the senator is just, you know, this seems an awful lot, awful fast. Uh, when you know we have a commission set up, we have a process. It seems like they were pretty re resound in what they were doing, the the steps they took. I I don't necessarily judge them on what they voted on. So I guess my question is like, is this necessary? Chair Dietzik. Um Thank you, uh, Chairman Quaid, and thank you, Senator Lang, for the question. Um, as I was, you know was hearing about it afterwards, um, part of my, one of the things I asked was, again, is this expansion of gambling and who has the authority to expand gambling? Um, I don't know the intention of any of the members on the commission. I, I'm not going to read into what they said. I don't think the, um, the tracks had any bad intention. Um, I have actually been to, I haven't been to Running Aces, I've been to Canterbury Downs many times. I do want them to succeed. Um, and, and that's why we took out the, the Senator Gustafson amendment, because I do think that's a good amendment. Um, but I do question on, is this expansion of gambling? And I view that it is. And who has the authority to do that? And I don't believe the Racing Commission does. So um, I think it is, if we are going to look at expanding gambling, I think that is gaming. I think that is a discussion that, you know, someone else can offer a bill. And we should have that discussion um, and debate here at the legislature, not with the Racing Commission. Senator Lang. Senator oh, Lang. How? I thought you said how. I was like, I don't think how is here. No, Lang. That's uh, it. 
No, I, and I guess just uh, maybe one little comment. And anytime you have a bunch of legislators talking about algorithms and how machines work, we're probably looking at the wrong thing, and that's maybe where the Racing Commission belongs. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen pictures of machines side by side and trying to distinguish which is which and what button does what. And I, I mean, and <laughs> it's a very strange position to be in the state and local government and veterans committee and have to be deciding on what gaming machines are. I, that's why this commission exists, right? That's why the the MIGA exists. That's why we put these commissions in place so they can make these decisions and hopefully we don't end up in a lawsuit, I guess. But anyways, there we are. Um, thank you, Senator Lang. Uh, Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dietzik, um, why not just let the lawsuit proceed? Because it is very detailed and uh, we've trusted, we put great trust certainly by the, by the existing commissions that we have existing all over the state. Why not let them uh, proceed? Chair Dietzik. Um, uh, thank you again, Chairman Quaid. Um, Senator Curran, can you just clarify what lawsuit you're talking about? Well, Senator Curran. My, um, my understanding, right, that there's threat in a lawsuit that if this is uh, violating the, uh, their ability to extend this particular gaming oper operation in the tracks, why not let the proper, proper venues of the vehicles that are in place today determine that? And why would the legislature be step forward in this particular case without a whole lot of information, without a whole lot of time to be able to do a thorough assessment of what is that differentiation between the games that one have deemed, it's just opinion, everybody stated their opinion, but there hasn't been a thorough um, analysis of it meeting the opportunity or meeting or violating what we, what's been said. So why not let it play out and through the process if there's a challenge in the court, let, the, let that process be had. Chair Dietzik. Um, um, thank you again. Um, Chairman Quaid and Senator Cran, I, I didn't consider any lawsuit. That is not, um, I'm not aware of any lawsuit, pending lawsuit, and so that's not why I brought this forward. Um, the, my understanding is the Gambling Control Board did issue an opinion and advice that um, they also question on if this was um, considered appropriate. And again, it just gets to the legislature has the authority to expand gaming and not the Racing Commission. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dietzik. Senator Cran. Senator Dietzik, I, I just think there's a vehicle that allows for the agreed parties, you know, to file writ and, and pursue in court and have it thoroughly um, analyzed. And I think that's the path it should take. I don't, I don't think the legislature here in this case, this is look in the time frame without, without, with very little notice hearing or thorough or thoughtful review. Um, we're gonna go out and shut it down and, and to remove those processes that are available to all parties in the judicial system. We just saw last week, the legislature stepped in again for the city of Minneapolis um, to avoid a lawsuit for decisions they made and to try and close off that vehicle to have it adjudicated where it should be. Um, I think this, it just appears to be a personal grievance uh, the session of personal grievances, and that's just not how we legislate. We have vehicles to address all these issues. We should let the commission do their work, and for that, I can't support the bill. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Cran. Um, other member questions or comments? Um, Senator Dietzik, Chair Dietzik, I wanna thank you for bringing this forward. I um, am a person who's really opposed to the expansion of gambling, whether it is these slot machines or historic race, horse racing or sports betting on premise or mobile. Um, and so I, sitting on the Human Services Committee, we do a lot in substance use disorder treatment and the co-occurrence between gambling and substance use disorder is so high, it's like 60 to 75%. And there is no benefit to gambling for a person at all. It is highly addictive. The reason why when you use social media and you can do the ever loving scroll down, it mimics slot machines. It gives you the same dopamine rush as gambling. It's why social media can be addicting. So I, I um, you know, to your earlier question, Senator Cran, <clears throat> I think that with the amendment we saw from Senator Gustafson to not take away something that already exists, that is already a revenue stream for racetracks, uh, that is probably why this is a really important bill now, is to not go down this road of creating a revenue stream that um, the Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division of DPS has already said violates the law and gave their opinion that it violates the law and matches um, 
slot machines, we can stop that before it happens. And so I just as a, a senator who is vehemently opposed in general to the expansion of gambling in any way that it happens, but in particular a way that, that it feels a little too cute by half, um, I, I'm very supportive of your bill, Chair Dietzik, and, and for the quickness with which you acted to get this done. So if there are no other member comments, we are go Senator Cram. Ma Madam Chair, what's the path for this bill? This will be uh, passed if passed, uh, sent to general orders. Okay, thank you. I request a roll call. Uh, thank you, Senator Cranton. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Um, take the roll. Chair McQuaid. Aye. Chair Dietzik. Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Mitchell. Senator Anderson. Senator Barr. Uh, no. Senator Carlson. Aye. Senator Swadzinski. Yes. Senator Dreskowski. No. Senator Fate. Senator Gustafson. Yes. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Just to clarify, I think you, you should have stated as amended. You said uh, as passed uh, without the amendment word, so I just want to make sure we're on record as saying it as, as amended, but I am still a no. Senator Coran? No. Senator Lang? No. Senator Morrison? Aye. There being six yes votes and five no votes, Senate File 5354, as amended, um, is recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. All right. And with Okay, um, we have two more bills that were on the agenda. We are gonna move those to another day. <clears throat> so be on the lookout for that agenda. And with that, the business in front of this committee is adjourned. <laughs>